This is kind of a big picture video that kind of ties in Morgan's discoveries with Mendelian discoveries. So Mendel, Gregor Mendel was the P guy. So in other videos or in other parts of the syllabus, you're actually going to understand how to do Punnett squares. So you should be actually quite familiar with that already, being able to have a genotype of one parent and a genotype of another parent and be able to just use a simple mathematic Punnett square, 2x2 two two, or sometimes 4x4 four four for a dihybrid cross for higher level people to be able to kind of predict what the outcomes will be. Those are very mathematical predictions and that evidence, all the data there, uh, really follows along with what this guy discovered, Mendel. And a lot of the traits that he was studying in his pea plants really followed these predicted ideas based on mathematics and uh, Punnett squares that we use today. His rules still apply, but there was some other evidence that kind of arose later on in the 20th century, which didn't seem to fit it. And so the question was, oh my gosh, was Mendel totally wrong? Or is this more information that's added to his theory? So Mendel's second law was called the law of independent assortment. And this is explained in another video. It's actually quite complex because we have to be able to picture how it all works. And now with our knowledge of chromosomes and genes and meiosis, it makes sense when we're looking at the process of meiosis. But the law of independent assortment basically says each gene that's inherited assorts itself independently of the others. In better English, what it means is that what one particular gene passes on into a gamete doesn't affect what else gets passed on. So every event of deciding which of the two alleles gets passed on to the next generation is completely independent of other ones. So you can pass on a big B and you can pass on a big C. Or you could pass on a big B and you can pass on a little c if both parents are heterozygous. They're both equally as likely. Once again, if that sounds confusing, you really need to see that visually. And so there's another video that I've made that tries to show how this idea is actually linked to meiosis. So basically, because of this law and because of this idea of independent assortment, the mathematical predictions were always pretty easy to calculate. But like I said, some new data came out in the 20th century that didn't quite fit this model. The only explanation that was put forth that really gained any traction was this idea from Thomas Hunt Morgan. This is Thomas Hunt Morgan, and he started using this idea of linked genes to explain some weird things he was finding when he was studying genetic crosses in these Drosophila fruit flies, basically. What he found when looking at the ratios was that male flies and female flies ended up with very different inheritance patterns. And so he proposed this idea that some of these genetic traits could actually be linked to the actual sex or gender of the actual flies. So it was called sex linkage. We know already from some of the ideas and traits that we've been studying in the IB biology syllabus that sex linkage does exist. And two of the most well understood and most common ideas are colorblindness and hemophilia and you should understand depending on how you set up the traits it's a lot more likely for boys for men to actually end up colorblind because they only have one copy of the gene because these genes are actually located on the x chromosome Remember that the X chromosome is actually one of the sex chromosomes. If you're male, your sex chromosomes are XY. If you're female, your sex chromosomes are XX. If that gene is located on the X chromosome, then that means if you're a girl, you actually have two copies of it. Whereas if you're a boy, you only have one copy of it. So whatever you get on that one X chromosome is what you have as a trait. And finally, one more aspect that is actually quite tricky and quite hard to solve in a particular genetic type question, but this is just an overview to show you the big picture idea of what's going on here with Morgan's discovery to kind of update Mendel's ideas here. And so besides having genes that could be linked to the sex chromosomes on the X chromosome, we also found that in order for Mendel's laws to work, this law of independent assortment, it means that the two traits he's looking at have to be on different chromosomes. They have to be on different chromosomes. If they're on different chromosomes, then the math usually works out. The easy, predictable ratios usually work out. But when you end up with weird things where the ratios don't work out, the explanation that was proposed was that perhaps those two genes, those two traits that are being looked at are not located on different chromosomes, but instead they're located on the same chromosome. And if they're located on the same chromosome, they tend to be inherited together. It's highly unlikely that those two particular 
traits or genes that are located on the same chromosome will get separated unless something that we understand now crossing over between homologous chromosomes actually separates. So each of these ideas here, meiosis, crossing over, sex linkage, linked genes on autosomes, law of independent assortment, Punnett squares, each of these is a separate piece. And when you're studying genetics, it's kind of hard to see how all these different bits and pieces fit together into one large big picture here. So the idea is that a lot of the original work was done by Mendel and as science progressed we found out more information when we actually studied genetic traits in specific organisms and weird things popped up that we can't understand. Even nowadays there are weird things that pop up that these some of these basic laws, these basic uh, ideas don't actually understand and it makes us form new theories and new ideas so we can come up with explanations and uh, genetics is actually becoming a lot more interesting these days when we start thinking about epistasis and gene silencing and other types of environmental effects that can affect my genes and which ones actually get passed on to the next generation.